Hey there everybody, it's Mark Crowley. I'm back with another video. This is my question and answer video number 22. And when I do these videos, I like to give myself little challenges, little drawing challenges. And so uh, you can see what I'm doing here today is trying to do a drawing that's white colored pencil on black paper. Um, and so that's what you're going to be seeing me work on. I gave myself a little head start, got the basic guidelines in place, because this one's going to take a little bit longer than some of these other ones. I'm going to go for, you know, almost a kind of photo reel approach, um, a knock on wood. But before I get any further with that, I want to let you all know that uh, I have some happy news. Dominar el manga, the second uh, version, uh, has gone into the Spanish uh, printing. Boy, I wish I could say that a little more. <laughs> <laughs> the Spanish language edition. They've translated not just the first book, but the second book. I think that's what I was trying to say. And uh, not only that, but the South Korean edition also going for the number two uh, uh, edition of the book. So that's happy news for me, especially this Korean edition. I, uh, I'm, I'm thrilled that they've uh, you know had enough success with book number one that they've actually gone for book number two. So I wanted to sort of share the joy, my joy anyway, uh, with you at the beginning of this video. So, uh, as always, I'm going to have 10 uh, basic questions and then 10 uh, lightning round questions towards the end uh, of the video. But I decided with this one, uh, somewhat unusually, to begin with, uh, maybe you can call it question number zero, <laughs> because it uh, precedes all the other questions in a sense. And uh, the question is this from Synergy. Uh, CK. How long did it take you to work out the words in the video to include old man time lapse? Now, uh, before I even answer this question, I kind of explain, I need to explain what what the question is all about. Now, in, uh, I do these videos that, that let people know that I'm looking for questions. Uh, many of you have seen them before, maybe some of you haven't, but they um, they involve mainly just text um, working its way across the screen. And um, basically they're just letting people know, you know, uh, I'm going to be doing a question and answer video, so just uh, post your uh, comments or questions in the comment section of this video, and then I'll pull from those. I'll, uh, I'll look through all of those and choose the ones that I want to uh, respond to. Well, what I've done in, uh, boy, it seems like the last four or five of these videos is I sneak in a sort of a hidden message by uh, changing the color of selected letters um, throughout the video, and then the careful people can string those uh, letters together, and I thought it might be kind of fun to show you how I actually do that. This uh, shows you um, how I sit down and, and kind of try to find the letter, like, hey there everybody, and I sort of darkened in the O. It's been a long time, and there's the L, since I did, and that's the D. Um, this is actually how I work these things out on this highly valuable piece of scrap paper. <laughs> And uh, so, I don't know, I thought that might be interesting for some of you. That's why that's question number zero, because <laughs> it is kind of a weird thing for me to talk about, to explain uh, in one of these Q&A videos. Anyway, let's get on uh, to question number one. comes from Hammy Latte. Do you ever get discouraged during a drawing and start over, or do you stay persistent and keep going until it's done? Um, that uh, question actually makes me think of uh, of the times where I have had to give up on uh, certain illustrations because they just weren't working out. But um, as I thought about it, it seems to me that you have to give every drawing that you're working on a chance, and uh, at least I do. And I, I work on it for quite a while. I'd say I get at least halfway through. Uh, before deciding whether it's it's working or not, and uh, there uh, there certainly have been times um, you know when I'm doing a, an illustration for Brody's Ghost or whatever, and I just realize this is not working, this is not working, and I have to bail. But um, you know you don't really know until you've gone pretty far along with it be, uh, to to see if it's going to work or not. And so I'm kind of between these two things. You know, the, uh, the person asked uh, about the, you know, do you stay persistent and keep going? Uh, or when you're discouraged, do you just give up and stop? Um, I think you have to stay persistent up to a point. I do, anyway. And then um, that's when I kind of uh, have to... <laughs> Say, so, now nah, this just isn't working. Um, oh, you know, before I move on to uh, the next question, I wanted to point out, because sometimes people wonder, um, you know, how can you do a drawing like this? Well, I'm actually looking at a piece of glass here and uh, getting some reference 
I'm a big believer in reference. I've said that uh, a lot, but I don't know if everyone's heard it, that uh, it's important to look at an actual object if you're trying to learn how to draw it. Uh, no reason to try to commit it all to memory when you can just, um, you know, look at, I mean, you know, Leonardo da Vinci looked at uh, the Mona Lisa, right? He didn't try to just commit her face to memory. There's no shame in using reference and looking at the, the thing that you're trying to draw. Anyway, enough about that. Let's get on to this next question from Lonely Hunter. Uh, do you think it's important for an aspiring artist, but still a beginner, to work with some sort of schedule on a regular basis, or is it better to draw whenever uh, you feel like it only? Um, well, I think some of you are going to be able to guess my answer to this question. Um, I think it's probably pretty dangerous if you want to get good at anything, uh, if you get into the mentality of only doing it when you feel like it. Um, then you're probably just going to be too lazy and not uh, putting in the necessary uh, amount of work to, to really improve. I've always thought that if you want to get good at drawing, if you want to get good at writing, if you want to get good at sports, whatever it is, you almost have to get a, a sort of tunnel vision. You have to get a little bit obsessed and uh, constantly uh, work and get into it. And I think the two of them are sort of like, I guess we would call it a virtuous cycle. If you have some amount of talent for something, you um, will enjoy doing it, I think, so much that it doesn't feel like a chore for you to sit down and do it. Um, and so you, you're doing it all the time because you enjoy it. Uh, and then that makes you get better, and then so that it sort of goes back and forth over and over again. And um, I think if something feels completely like a chore, like for me, you know, I'll tell you the truth, math, you know, doing working out math problems, that to me is a chore, it does not come naturally to me. Um, it, I don't get that. I know some people, you know, who have the knack for it or just have the interest in it. There's there's a great joy to be had in working out a math problem. And as a result, they probably, uh, you know, will work at them a lot and get better at it and so forth. So um, I think those two things uh, kind of connect. You, if you are at least a little good at something, you will enjoy the process of working at it day after day. I don't sort. I mean, I don't look back on my life and say, "Oh man, I didn't feel like drawing, and I had to force myself to sit down and keep at it." You know, it wasn't like that. I I always enjoyed it. I always felt like doing it. Um, so, anyway, that's the way it kind of goes for me. Um, I want to say a thing or two about this challenge that I've set for myself: working with uh, white lines on a uh, black surface. It is not something I've done a lot over the years. It's kind of a fun challenge for me. I'm not saying I've never done it before, but um, it's been a while, certainly, since I tried one of these. Um, I know they have, like, scratch board prepared things where you actually scratch it away and you can get highly detailed, and who knows, maybe that can be a, a challenge for another time, but um, I just wanted to point out something. You know, it requires you to reverse a lot of your of your process. I'm used to working, uh, putting the shadows in and saving the highlights for last. In a way, I'm doing the highlights first and kind of not doing the shadows at all. Uh, I mean, the paper is supplying <laughs> the, the blackness that's in the illustration. And so it does require a certain, you know, mental juggling, uh, and um, but it's fun. I'm enjoying it so far. And I hope you back at home are enjoying it too. <laughs> Announcer voice. Let's move on to the next one here from Ro Pira. Uh, if you could have anyone in the world or past have dinner with you, who would you choose and why? Uh, love this question, and as I thought about it, I realized there was one name that popped into my mind pretty clearly, and that is uh, Mr. Brad Bird the uh, writer-director of The Iron Giant, of The Incredibles, of Ratatouille. Um, boy, how much fun would it be to sit down and have uh, dinner with him, talk to him about you know his process and so forth, or just about anything. And, you know, I'm saying that partly because I'm a huge fan of his work, but I'm also saying that because, you know, I listen to, like, the DVD commentary of, um, of The Incredibles, and some of the other ones, I think also, yeah, Iron Giant has DVD commentary. And he just seems like a nice guy, you know? You can tell. And I think that when I answer that question about who would you like to have dinner with, uh, sometimes you sort of pause and think, well, boy, what if my the person that I think of as my hero 
uh, is actually no fun to <laughs> have lunch with, you know? I mean, I've heard that, like, when you try to talk to Robert De Niro, apparently, he's just, he's not a very social guy. He's super quiet. Uh, and I, I bet having lunch with him would be incredibly awkward <laughs> from what I've heard. I don't know. I've never had lunch with any famous people. But uh, so, yeah, Brad Bird would be my answer to that question. Let's move on to the next one. Uh, from Caesar, Antonio Zappelli. Uh, number five uh, question, which do you think is the uh, best approach uh, for someone looking to break into the graphic novel slash manga world, starting an internet comic or submitting a few chapters to a publisher? Um, well, this is interesting because um, I've done a video that's ab about my process, the process that I used for getting published, and uh, it was back before the real... Um, well, I guess it was at the dawn of the internet, but it was back in the days when people were still mailing things. And, and uh, the idea of building a reputation online was certainly not um, an option back then. So I was doing photocopies and mailing things around. Uh, I've gone through that whole story of how I first got published. Um, actually, in one of these videos, I, I called it Message to My Subscribers number 5. I'll put a link in the info box if you're curious about how I got published and what my advice uh, is in terms of getting published. Um, but, you know, the, this question is a little different because it's really asking now, what would your advice be now uh, for someone who's trying to break into graphic novels or um, comics? And I would say now, definitely it is wise to start building something online. Um, and, you know, maybe it's, it's not either or. You could do both, right? You could start to build your uh, audience online, and you could be mailing things around. Um, the prime piece of advice that I gave back in that other video was that um, it, if you're going to mail stuff around, like photocopies of your work, uh, for me, I'd say mail it to the smaller companies, the smaller publishers uh, first. The really huge companies like uh, DC or Marvel, they're just they're so big that uh, I don't think they're honestly... Um, even opening that stuff up. They're probably just throwing it all in the garbage, frankly, uh, when people mail in things. But I think the smaller publishers do still open these packages and uh, check them out, and if your stuff is good, they may uh, you know, get in touch with you and invite you uh, to you know, sign a contract and get that. I mean, that's how it happened for me. So never give up hope, people. Uh, if what you're doing really is good, that's the big F, if what you're doing is really amazing and uh, worthy of being published, it, I think it will eventually find someone who um, kind of becomes a fan of it. That's what it really comes down to. The publisher themselves, they see what you're doing and they're like, I want to publish this. I want to see what this is, you know, as a finished thing. Anyway, so that's my advice. Yes, go ahead and do both. Uh, mail things around, but also try to build an audience online. Where would you do that? You know, um, DeviantArt, I suppose, is a place. I've seen some people um, building up, uh, you know, putting up one comic book page uh, per day. That's a pretty tight schedule. I'd say maybe two or three per week or something. Keep a regular, regular schedule. That's the key to anything on the Internet, a regular schedule. And you can see how I've done that with videos. Every Friday, new video every Friday. People like to know when you're going to be updating. They want to be able to just count on that. And if you prove that you're reliable, um, people will reward you by showing up and, and watching what you're doing. Here's a sort of an interesting thing. I've, I'm, I'm noticing that my pencil is starting to get dull, so you know what? I'm just going to switch to another pencil over here that's sharpened. Some people get the idea that my pencils are eternally sharpened, um, and I, I have to smile a little because um, there are edits in a lot of my videos. You know, I do, I do hit the pause button, and that's a great time for me to sharpen the old pencil. Um, so no, I don't have magic non-dulling pencils. If anyone knows of such pencils, let me know so I can go uh, get some. You know what? I, uh, I announced that last question as question number five, and it was actually the fourth <laughs> question I asked. I accidentally skipped a question. So let's get back to question number four here. Proximatiz HD. Proximatiz? I hope that's right. Uh, the question is, uh, I've been trying to get on one of these videos for like two years now. 
Do you feel like you ever do yourself a disservice by not drawing a traditional style of manga? Um, you know, hang on, before I answer this, I want to show uh, what my manga style looks like so that people will sort of understand, get some perspective on my answer. All right, so this is from Miki Falls, my um, first manga style, <clears throat> or heavily manga influenced, let's say. Uh, graphic novel series, and you can see that the way I drew her face, the facial proportions are, I would admit, a little bit off. Uh, people complained that the chins are too large, and I think they kind of are. Um, the uh, the drawing style that I used, or the technique, was uh, colored pencil. You know, the classic, uh, now classic, curly black Prismacolor, um, with um, a considerable amount of gray toning in Photoshop. Um, and so that that one really is, you know, I would say maybe tinged with manga style, but by no means uh, would I say that it is, you know, mis something where someone would look at it and say, hey, that looks just like a manga. You know, it's not, I mean, the, the technique that's being used and uh, indeed the facial proportions are not so close. Now, this one uh, from Brody's Ghost, uh, my latest series. Um, I would argue that uh, her face, Talia's face here, is pretty close uh, to some styles of manga. Um, but as for like the rest of the drawing style throughout the series, um, no, I'm not killing myself to try to to pass myself off as a Japanese artist. I'm not drawing this and presenting it in such a way that someone might say, wow, you know, this came from Japan and uh, they translated it into, into English. I mean, that seems like a game that I don't want to play, really, uh, frankly. Uh, I, I'm an American guy. Uh, uh, Japan has been an important part of my life. Uh, Japanese cartooning styles are something that I've worked into what I'm doing, but I'm not really interested in, in trying to, you know, fool people into thinking that uh, um, um, my artwork is exactly the same as people in Japan. You know, that just uh, is not something that I've been pursuing, really. Um, but to answer the question, to go back to the long, long ago when I had that question, um, you know, uh, boy, what was that question? Do you, oh yeah, do you think you uh, uh, did yourself a disservice by not drawing a traditional style of manga? I would admit that maybe... In in the case of Miki Falls, I maybe did do myself a bit of a disservice in terms of the uh, the mass appeal of that book. I think if I had made it look a little more like a real shoujo manga, which is what the sort of uh, goal you know the 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 goal of the book was to create something that that would fit that category to a, to a degree. The idea of the sort of high school romance. Uh, although, of course, there's copious amounts of supernatural elements that eventually break it completely away from uh, a high school romance. But I think maybe that series p may have done better, certainly among the manga-buying community, if I had tried a little harder to, you know, get those facial proportions closer to a traditional uh, manga approach. And, you know, who knows, maybe that pencil drawing style put some people off. I I like the look of the, the sort of soft look uh, of that pencil style. I'm, I don't think I'm going to say that I regret that choice. But, you know, if I went back in time and, and uh, could start Mickey Falls all over again, I think certainly the way I drew the faces uh, would be closer to some sort of manga, some sort of acceptable, recognizable manga style, rather than what I did, which was sort of a hybrid between uh, manga style and my own uh, approaches to uh, to drawing faces and so forth. Anyway, let us move on to question number six. How long does a video take on average? Um, I don't know if I've answered this one before, and it is sort of an interesting thing to talk about. You know, it's Friday morning as I do this video. It's about 10.37. <laughs> as I look at the, the clock, and um, that's typically what I do, you know, if I can, I like to do these videos on Friday morning, edit them in the middle of the day, basically, and then get them online by um, 2 o'clock p.m. on Friday. Now, I'm looking at this drawing that I'm very slowly working my way through, and I'm going to predict it's going to be a little late today, folks. Uh, I'm not going to get this one uh, online as early as I normally do. Uh, but I do 
basically, you know, I go through a sort of a schedule of getting my Brody's Ghost work uh, and different other things like public speaking work, getting that done uh, during the week, Monday through Friday, and then in, uh, or Monday through Thursday, I guess I should say. And then um, I, I, during that time, I'm trying to think about, boy, what is my Friday video going to be? Uh, and uh, if I can decide early in the week, I might set aside some time for sort of doing, uh, you know, studies and, and familiarizing myself. Say I wanted to draw, um, you know, Sora uh, from uh, Kingdom Hearts, as I did um, I, I wouldn't just launch into that video without ever having drawn Sora before. No, you know, probably on Wednesday or Thursday I would start doing um, studies of that face, the facial structure, trying to figure out, um, you know, how close the eyes are to the nose and so forth and, and start to try to memorize that, um, that basic way of drawing the face prior to Friday morning when I sit down and do the actual video. So there's a little bit of prep work uh, if I can squeeze it in uh, prior to Friday. Uh, but basically the actual, you know, shooting of the video takes place um, on a Friday morning and depending on the the detail required for the subject matter I can actually finish shooting the video in as little as two hours three hours. This one's going to take a lot longer, I can tell, just because of what I'm going for. Um, the editing takes at least another hour. You know, I think what happens, like, uh, a lot of times you, people know that I launch, I'll do the uh, time-lapse version on Fridays. The time-lapse version doesn't take so much time to edit. I just pull, you know, I, I remove the audio, <laughs> basically. Uh, I uh, string it all together and uh, set set some music to it, and it's good to go. Um, the narrated version takes a longer time to edit. You know, you gotta you're just dealing with uh, the words I'm saying and so forth. It just takes longer, and so that's why that one tends to not go up until the following day, uh, Saturday. If indeed that's the kind of video that I'm doing. So, boy, I don't know if I've answered that question very well, but you, uh, I thought it might be fun for people to hear about my process of making these videos and, and how it works. I don't talk about that too much. Um, but uh, basically, yeah, it's a, it, it's a Friday thing, man. It's <laughs> Every Friday I'm sitting down and uh, getting this done, with the exception of sometimes when I'm out of town. Uh, and that has happened uh, on occasion that I know I'm going to be out of town on Friday, so I'll shoot the video uh, early. Uh, but like I said, you know, I think you've got to stick to your schedule, and I think pe people might be sort of angry. Wait a minute, man. You've been holding out on us? You mean to say you've had videos done on a Monday or Tuesday, and you just sat on it for the whole week? <gasps> You're cruel and evil. Um, but, you know, the truth is uh, I have done that on occasion, and I will do so again, by golly, if I need to. Um, I think it is important to, to stick to a schedule, uh, certainly with YouTube. Uh, people, pretty much all the people who have succeeded on YouTube, I think, have, have got a schedule, and the video comes out on a particular day. Um, I could be wrong about that, but I, I do think that that's, uh, that's part of how you do it. That's part of how you build up an audience. In any case, let's move on to that next question. Oh, sorry about that, folks. I just realized after I got uh, into that next question that I had failed to credit the uh, asker of the previous question about uh, how long does the video take. Um, that that question was asked by Mita Awesome, M-I-T-A-W-S-O-M-E 21. Uh, so thank you so much for that question. Let's move on to the next one from J.C. Uh, and the question is, when you made Mastering MAGA 2, why didn't you do a male bird's eye point of view and a female worm's eye point of view? Um, I thought this was a good question to allow me to sort of talk about the process of creating Mastering MAGA 1 and 2 and planning out the lessons and so forth. Um, you know, unfortunately, you have to make some tough decisions when you make a book like that. Uh, in Mastering MAGA 2, there is a section... Uh, well, hang on, I'll show it to you. 
I have the Korean edition handy, so that's what I'm going to use just for fun. But uh, so here's the I have a lesson on drawing a female uh, uh, bird's eye point of view, much as I did in my uh, recent video, although I changed the hairstyle and so forth. And so you can see it's a step by step thing that takes you through that process. And then let's see here, next page, we see the uh, male point of view, a slight worm's eye. Uh, you see below his jaw. Um, so I had to make a choice which one is going to be the female, which one is going to be the male. Um, just sort of randomly I decided uh, to make one <coughs> the male, the other the female. Um, if I had tried to do both uh, for both of those lessons it would have taken up so many uh, pages in the book and uh, and that would have cut out something else that I had to do later in the book. So I just wanted to take a moment to explain how, you know, there's a lot of regrets, sadly, when you do a uh, how to draw book, all these tough choices you have to make, um, including one thing uh, and not including another thing. Um, but um, hopefully, and I have good reason to believe, there will be more uh, such books in the future, and I can get to some of these uh, things that I was not able to include in Mastering Manga 1 or 2 uh, in some sort of uh, subsequent book. Um, so, but in, in any case, that's uh, sort of a little explanation uh, about uh, how that happened fairly randomly. I think, I, I guess I thought that the, the male drawing showing the underside of the jaw was maybe a little easier to do because uh, male characters have this sort of stronger angular jaw. Um, a little tricky to make a feminine looking character, a worm's eye point of view, but you know, hopefully I'll be able to get to that in some sort of lesson, maybe uh, in a video lesson, who knows, but uh, in any case, let us move on to the next question, and that one is from Yuffie81. Did you begin to do how to draw videos after you became famous with your drawings, or did you become famous through YouTube? Well, of course I have to begin by saying I'm not famous. Let's just be clear about that. I'm not famous, people. Uh, I want you to understand that uh, you know I'm just quoting the question there. I do not actually believe uh, that I'm famous <clears throat> in any way. Uh, but I did want to sort of talk about the order in which things happened. Some people may believe, um, I don't know if they believe this, but some people may be under the impression that uh, that I was kind of laboring in obscurity until I started doing YouTube videos and then suddenly I became known to the world by way of YouTube. Uh, that is not the case. I had uh, first had my comic books published in <clears throat> 1995 and then um, built up uh, a fair amount of recognition, especially later on when they were turned into chapter books by Random House Children's Books and those uh, books, the uh, Akiko series, became fairly widely known I mean, the first book in the series sold uh, more than 100,000 copies, and, um, uh, you know, you could find them in libraries and so forth. Some people have still uh, seen them. Uh, as, uh, you know, I hear, I get emails periodically, hey, they have a Kiko in my library. So um, I had become known in certain circles. I'm not going to say famous, certainly not famous, not even close, but uh, within the world of children's books, um, I was a known quantity within the American comic book industry. Um, you know, it's a certain division of it, I'd say the, the alternative uh, division of the American comic industry in the 90s, I used to attend a lot of conventions, and so I was fairly um, well known among those people. Uh, but again, no, nowhere near what, what I would call famous, <laughs> even within those industries. Um, and that was when finally I uh, started doing videos for YouTube. So uh, really, um, I ha was fairly established, and uh, you know, uh, certainly not an unknown uh, when I started doing YouTube videos. But I must say, once I started doing YouTube videos, I became known to a lot of different people who would never have heard of me otherwise. Um, and to the degree to which one can use the word uh, famous in connection with me, um, maybe we can use the phrase internet famous, I don't know, <laughs> YouTube famous, uh, in, in contrast to, to being actually famous. Uh, I've, you know, clearly I've built up a certain position within the how to draw video section of YouTube. Um, but that's about as far as it goes, really. It's not like, um, you know, I've never been, like, checking into a hotel and had someone say, wait a minute, Mark Crilly? I watch your videos. That, that kind of thing has never happened. Um, 
maybe once or something like that. Someone has recognized uh, the name. But uh, anyway, the, my main thing was to talk about the order in which this stuff happened. And um, yeah, I have to acknowledge that um, certainly in terms of overseas, uh, people knowing who I am, uh, it's got to be, you know, YouTube has made a huge difference uh, in that regard. I was, um, you know, I don't think I had really, uh, well, well, Akiko, the children's book series, was uh, briefly published in, in Italian. I don't know how well it did, but, uh, you know, I was. Uh, there were pockets of um, uh, places in different countries where I would have been known um, prior to YouTube, but uh, YouTube has certainly given an international aspect uh, to what I'm doing on a weekly basis, and I, I just love that. I feel very, very fortunate. Um, to have gained that kind of uh, exposure uh, to, uh, you know, again, people who are trying to learn how to draw, basically, is, are, are going to be the people who know me. Um, so, anyway, let us move on to another question. This one from Comet Lane. And I think we're already at number nine here, yeah. Um, Comet Lane asks, How do you tell the difference between stealing someone's ideas and just pulling inspiration from them? Uh, I love this question, and I think it has, uh, you know, the answer to it can be quite useful. Um, I, when it comes to the difference, to me, between um, being inspired by somebody and copying their ideas, it all comes down to specifics and details. I'd say you, you are free to borrow a basic core concept. You are not free to take the the particulars, the details of that concept. So, you know, for example, um, I noticed that uh, the comic book series Naruto, which uh, was and remains uh, hugely popular, uh, the early books in the series had an aspect of uh, training that um, the person, you know, the it was in a location where you were watching someone train and uh, acquire uh, their skills or hone their skills by way of study. Now, um, that uh, is not a, a new thing. It's been in a lot of stuff. You know, uh, Harry Potter has that same concept. And I sort of noticed, well, yeah, boy, look at that. A lot of these uh, successful series have an aspect of watching someone train uh, and acquire, you know, sort of uh, gradually gain control over their powers. Well, that clearly had an influence on Brody's ghost. Um, when I sat down to create Brody's Ghost, I thought, well, let's see if we can get some kind of teacher uh, figure, yeah, sort of like the way that uh, Luke Skywalker had uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi or Yoda. Um, I decided to try to introduce an aspect of that into um, Brody's Ghost. And so I think that's an example of being inspired without stealing, you know, the particular ideas um, I think you really do get yourself into trouble when you start taking actual, you know, you know, if you took some of the the core details of uh, Harry Potter and you, you know, you say, okay, there's a school <laughs> that's out in the, you know, the countryside, and you get there by train, um, you know, and you introduce your character uh, with an unhappy life. Uh, living under a staircase, you know, with uh, uncles and aunt who are really terrible and mean. Uh, at, at that point, yeah, you're not, you're not just being inspired by Harry Potter. You're ripping off Harry Potter, and everyone can tell. Uh, they can see it uh, from a mile away. Uh, so that's really uh, the key. I would say is to you know stay away from the details, um, but you are free to take the core concept, the basic concept, and and put your own spin on it. Um, so, anyway, that brings us to the last of uh, the, the real questions. Not to say that the lightning round questions aren't real, but these are the long, let's call them long-form questions, the questions that I answer at length. Um, question number 10 from Judy Starr. Uh, who exactly was the inspiration for Talia in Brody's Ghost? Um, that's an interesting question, and again, let me go ahead and grab the uh, comic book, because I want to show you one of my earlier creations actually was a bit of an inspiration on Talia. All right, so uh, in Minky Falls, there was this character named Yumi. She was like the best friend character. 
uh, of Akiko, and you can see that she had kind of a funky hairstyle, and she was very sassy and had this outsized personality. Um, and I, I kind of liked the way that people were responding to that character. Some people said that they actually uh, enjoyed uh, Yumi as a character more than they did Miki, uh, my main character, which, you know, maybe is a fault in the way that I depicted uh, Miki as a character in the story. But I thought, you know, let's uh, revisit this type of character, this sort of spunky, sassy character, um, and in terms of creating Talia for uh, Brody's Ghost. And that's... Um, that's kind of, I was almost sort of inspired uh, by my own previous character uh, to create this sassy, lively type of character. And I thought it was especially uh, interesting because we have a ghost, a character that's supposed to be dead, uh, making her very full of life and high energy. Uh, to me, the, the contrast of those two things uh, seemed pretty interesting. Um, and uh, otherwise, I'm not sure. And, you know, one thing that's a little bit, this might be surprising. To, uh, have any of you ever seen the movie Clueless? Um, that movie came back out in the 90s. It featured this um, valley girl type character as the main character. And um, I, I had an idea as I started working on Talia. I wanted to present her initially as a little bit uh, valley girl like. I wanted her to have a sort of valley girl, um, maybe I should explain that because maybe not everyone knows what that means, but it, it's sort of the, um, uh, you know, sort of a teenage type of girl from California who's like, oh, I went shopping and I was like, so awesome, you know, that <laughs> I hope I'm not <laughs> hurting anyone's ears with that terrible imitation, but uh, I was like at Abercrombie the other day, you know, this uh, this type of character. I um, I wanted to have her appear to be that type of character initially. I wanted people to kind of think, oh, I know who this is. She's um, she's a certain, you know, by the way she's dressed and some of the ways that she talks, um, I wanted people to come to a certain conclusion about who Talia was and to think of her as a, as a slightly goofy character or, you know, or one that is, you know, you wouldn't take too seriously. Um, and then, of course, I wanted to sort of pull the rug out from underneath the readers by having her later turn out to be, you know, pretty intense at certain times. And so, in a way, I deliberately presented her as one way uh, in the initial uh, introductory pages of that character, uh, so as to show different aspects of her character later on. Um, well, I'll tell you what, folks, we're going to be doing the lightning round uh, soon, but uh, what I want to do is um, do a little time lapse here, take this uh, illustration a little further along um, so that I can do some of the final highlights in uh, gouache uh, as we uh, do the lightning round questions. So uh, bear with me, we're going to bring in Old Man Time Lapse, you guessed it, and he's going to help me um, get through uh, to a, a near completed state uh, on this illustration. All right, well, I got all the uh, colored pencil part of it done. Time to pull out the gouache. Aww. And uh, move on to the lightning round. Now, for those of you who don't know, the lightning round is um, <clears throat> a quick little question, some of them quite silly, uh, quite deliberately so. So don't, I mean, sometimes people are like, what, why did you waste time on that silly question when you could have answered my deeply profound question about whatever, the history of art in Western Europe. Um, you know, the videos are, these question and answer videos are split pretty evenly between the uh, serious questions and the silly questions. And speaking of silly questions, let's get on to this lightning round uh, right now. Hang on just a second. Uh, this one from OUFan316. Whose voices do people compare yours to? You know, it's always Seth Rogen. Uh, or Kermit the Frog. <laughs> Those are the two 
<laughs> uh, voices that I'm constantly being compared to. Every once in a while, someone uh, says, boy, you sound just like, and they name some, I don't know, TV actor I've never heard of before, but uh, definitely Seth Rogen and Kermit. Those are the two that come up again and again. Um, Jesse Sketches asks, when did you start using the internet? It would have been the fall of 1995. I was teaching English right up until uh, 1994 in Taiwan. Uh, came home in the fall of 94. Took me a while to kind of get my uh, feet on the ground and um, it was late summer I believe uh, uh, that I was able to buy my own computer and uh, then soon thereafter in 1995 got uh, internet access. Boy, was it slow back then. <laughs> Dial up. Oh, yeah. Things have improved just a little since then. Uh, let's move on to the next one. Uh, do you have a pet? Now, some people will say, hey, Mark, you already answered this question in a previous video, and it's true, I did, but we have a new pet here in the house. We have a hamster, a hamster named Schnickerdoodle. <laughs> My daughter chose that name, and uh, so, yeah, we do still have the, the goldfish, that I probably mentioned uh, previously. And uh, I do have a bird feeder in the backyard, so I don't know if that counts. In any case, let's go ahead and move on to the uh, next one. How often do you wash your car? That question from Lilu uh, Murga. And uh, I gotta say, not often enough. If it were up to me, I would probably almost never wash my car. It's really my wife is the one who says, Mark, we, you have got to wash that car. <laughs> I can't even see through the windshield anymore. Uh, I'm a little lazy about that kind of stuff. Um, and I forgot to credit, I'm sorry, Crazy Draw was the person who asked, uh, do you have a pet? And uh, the next one, uh, Hank's Bob's World. No, Hank Bob's World. This is an important question, Krilly. Spicy curry or extra spicy curry? You know, I'm going to have to go for medium. I'm sorry, I can't even take spicy curry much less extra spicy curry. Uh, a bit of a wimp when it comes to that kind of stuff. And uh, a lot of times they say that it's medium, but it's actually pretty darn spicy. So, uh, yeah, sorry, I can't take either of those options that you gave me there. Um, and the next one, Birds of Darkness. Do you prefer dubbed anime or subbed anime? Uh, and subbed anime must mean subtitled. Uh, anime and uh, clearly uh, there's no question in my mind it's got to be subtitled I want to hear it in the original Japanese I can uh, I mean I hate to be a snob oh yes I just can't tolerate it um, but I am a little bit of a snob when it comes to that kind of stuff um, very hard for me to watch like Kiki's delivery service with the you know Californian actors redoing all those voices and you know even Phil Hartman I love Phil Hartman but boy man when they had him redo that cat oh Kiki and Gigi they uh, very nearly ruined uh, the movie uh, in my opinion sorry those of you who love the American dubbed version but I gotta speak from the heart when it comes to that one uh, next question from Aaron Mason. Could you give us the ISBN number for your Mastering Manga book, please? Well, of course, here it is on the screen right now. Uh, I do have to remind you, though, that ISBN, the N stands for number. So, if you say ISBN number, <laughs> you're repeating the word number twice. Uh, number eight, Akumi Irakon. Have you ever been to a concert? <laughs> I love this question because it sort of implies the possibility of me having never been to a concert in my whole life. And, you know, I, I'm lame, but I'm not that lame. Come on. Uh, my apologies to anyone watching this who hasn't been to a concert uh, in your life. It sure is an awful lot of fun. I've been to a number of them in my life. I'm not like a, a concert hound who's at them every weekend. Uh, the most recent one I went to was a Thomas Dolby concert. As a matter of fact, some of you may remember from a previous uh, video of mine, maybe the high school artwork video, that I revealed my love uh, of the music of Thomas Dolby back in high school and still today. And so, yes, I found myself at a Thomas Dolby uh, concert earlier this year. Uh, and moving on to question number nine from Rudu Chan. How did you feel when the U.S. lost to Belgium in the World Cup? Will you still agree to eat Belgian waffles if I made some for you? 
Of course I will still eat those Belgian waffles. My dedication to the American soccer team just completely falls to the ground when someone offers me Belgian waffles. Sorry guys, gotta go for the waffles. And this must bring us up to the 10th and final uh, lightning round question uh, from Kristen Nettles. How would you feel if someone were to co cosplay uh, on one of your characters? Uh, boy, I would love that. That would be a thrill. In fact, in a way, when I designed uh, Talia from Brody's Ghost, I, part in my mind I was like, she's got to be distinctive enough that if somebody wanted to cosplay her uh, in terms of costume and hairstyle, they, you know, it would be interesting that for them to do that because, you know, cosplaying Brody, I don't know, that's not, <laughs> not there's not going to be too much to that. But, uh, yeah, I definitely wanted to um, uh, yeah, create a character that would be worthy of that if someone were to decide to do it. I've never actually heard from anyone or seen a photo of anyone cosplaying um, uh, Talia or, or indeed any characters from any of my books, but, yeah, I'd love, I'd love to see that happen someday. And maybe I will be so lucky. But we're going to come down to really a final post-comment comment that I decided that's really not a question at all. Uh, it's just a comment that I saw that I thought I have to share this with my viewers. The comment comes from uh, Danny Dinkins, and it consists of just three words. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm sorry if you guys don't like that pun, but... I love it. Oh my gosh. I might just have to start saying that every once in a while. I feel like this illustration needs just a few more um, highlights by way of the white gouache, speaking of which. And so I'm going to go ahead and do that in time lapse and then we'll wrap it up. All right, well, that brings us to the end of another question and answer video. Please let me know what you thought about it, uh, and indeed what you thought about this technique with the black paper and the white colored pencil. Uh, I'd be happy to do a tutorial that you know takes you through the whole process step by step. But let's go ahead and thank anyone who has supported me by getting any of my books. We got Brody's Ghost and Miki Falls, my two graphic novel series, as well as Mastering Manga and Mastering Manga 2, my instructional how to draw books. Uh, you know, when you get those books, you really are helping me out, and I will never stop being appreciative of that. But let's go ahead and lay down this pencil. I really want to thank you one last time for watching this video, and I'll be back with another one real soon.